patient safety problem is huge. It exists everywhere. A study in the United States suggests that medical errors kill more people each year than do road traffic accidents, workplace accidents, and AIDS. any question it's a serious problem. We estimate the United States at least a million preventable injuries a year, about 100,000 preventable deaths a year. Why would we have error rates at that rate um, in systems that were ostensibly there to, to treat sick patients? Trying to face up to this as a public health problem, you know, like a disease, like road accidents, like um, tuberculosis, malaria, any sort of major public health problem and to get that addressed on a sort of systematic way by policy makers or by health service managers, that's also a very tough battle. Typically the error rates will come through as maybe two, three, five percent. I think what is important to remember is that each patient during their hospital stay will probably have 10 or 20 prescriptions written and will receive maybe up to 100 doses. Some organisations and circumstances are like this, highly vulnerable to error. Others have some measure of resistance. The aim is to reach this position, where resistance to error is part of normal life. So what needs to be done? They explained to me that they had anaesthetised Elaine but that her airway had collapsed. When I went across to the intensive care department, which was in the NHS hospital next door, the staff explained to me very bluntly that Elaine had been without oxygen for a significant period of time and that I was looking at her having significant brain damage. Another brain scan was taken and uh, the results of that were compared with the benchmark scan. And the difference to me as a layman was just shocking. Um, the original scan had texture, it had shape, it looked like a brain to me. The new scan was like looking at static on a television. And in consultation with the staff over the next couple of days, I made the decision to switch a life support off. One of the areas that concerned me was how it was going to be investigated. And when I spoke to a consultant about that in intensive care, he said to me, but it won't be investigated. And as a pilot, I couldn't accept that. As a fellow professional, how could you not want to learn from what had happened? So what's going on? Why do good organizations with highly skilled, well-motivated staff have the same problems over and over again? This handover is very similar to a pit stop in Formula One. Small infants are uh, monitored uh, very extensively during the operation and afterwards. And this is done through uh, catheter sprays in their arteries, their veins, and so forth. There is an ectocardiogram, and all this has to be disconnected while they are transferred to the intensive care unit and then reconnected. So if the patient's condition is critical, that becomes a very critical period in itself. All these pit stops are filmed, but also they have a human factor expert, an observer, watching, and the errors uh, are scored. There are five levels of errors, and the highest score goes for the small errors. People are unaware of them, and if you become aware of them, of course, you can do something to prevent them or recover from them if they do happen. A safe culture knows where the edge lies between dangers and safety. It respects and knows its hazards. It's a wary culture. It expects bad things to happen and has defenses in place to deal with them. I was a submariner for um, eight years. 
One of the things that I observed in the Navy is um, even the most senior people um, with the entire crew had to go through periodic training and get very specific feedback on their performance. And there was an assumption um, there at all times is that our performance could degrade over time. It wasn't a given and that in order to maintain this edge to our performance that we needed to have this type of training and this type of feedback. Compared to medicine where I think the physicians in particular get an awful lot of training and feedback uh, when they're coming up through the pipeline so to speak, the only time they get real constructive feedback um, later on in their journey is after an adverse outcome which is probably the hardest time to take the feedback and um, by that time it's too late. It all began with the boss being late. Yeah, I know it's urgent. Call Mr. Sugden and tell him to deal with it. We were standing there like an orchestra, waiting for the conductor to arrive. It was an apparently straightforward operation, something well within the competence of the team. I had reassured Mrs. Burton that the outlook was good, but she was the nervous type and insisted on waiting in the hospital. It wasn't just one thing that went wrong. We'd have coped with that. It was a whole list of things that eventually overwhelmed us. Mr. Burton was on anticoagulants for mild AF, but successive handover glitches meant that although the team knew this, no one had actually done anything about it. It was almost as if we were set up to fail. I still can't believe it happened the way it did. The surgeon's favourite retractor was missing. I should have told him before we started, but he was late and we were in a hurry. This is no good. Where's my retractor? This is dangerous. I can't see anything. But it was the only one we had in the set. There's bleeding. I'm going to have to enlarge this incision. I should have insisted on the proper retractor, but I didn't, and I got bleeding from the spleen. When I heard that, I knew the patient needed blood. But no blood was cross-matched. What do you mean there's no blood? Why didn't you tell me? I thought he knew. I accept... Well, I accept a level of responsibility for what happened. I should have checked on the blood, but we don't usually need blood, and I mean... Well, I could have been wrong, couldn't I? Ordinary events, the kinds of things that go wrong every day, ganged up on us. But there were so many of them that nothing we did seemed to make a difference. They didn't even have any platelets. We really need platelets. There didn't seem to be anybody in charge. Where are the platelets? What? The platelets! Why isn't the sucker working? We were changing the sucker, and it didn't help to be shouted at. We've got a major venous bleed now. Shall I get some O negative? This was my first case in a new job. The ECG was looking ischemic and I was getting scared. As things got worse, I could see friction building up between the surgeon and the anaesthetist. I need some 4 O proline, now! Can't you get control of this bleeding? I just can't keep up. Hold it, press on it, don't let go. His BP is only 80 over 40. The surgeon spoke less and less, and as he concentrated more on trying to fix the problem, he seemed to descend into tunnel vision. I just can't see where this is coming from. We just weren't prepared, and the team fell apart. Get some adrenaline. Move the bloody light. All of us could see what was happening. Things were going badly wrong and help was needed. I just had to speak up. If you need help, Mr. Anderson is in the next theatre. Shall I call him? But the surgeon was so stressed I couldn't make him hear. Nobody seemed to notice how much time was passing and just how much blood was being lost. We were losing him! Forty-five minutes after the operation had begun, Mr. Burton, under my care, had bled to death.